Well, we're told in 1 Timothy 3.16, which everyone here has memorized, that all Scripture is inspired by God and useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we are wrong and teaches us to do what is right. Now, Greg Gatesman's statement that he made yesterday really struck home. The law of God is the very mind of the character of God in print. Now, I paraphrase that a little bit. He had more to it, but that's the essence of what he said. And that is the truth. But quite often, we get bogged down in our ordinary lives doing ordinary things and we don't realize what we are doing. Just as Abram became Abraham, the father of the faithful under God's patient tutelage, God will also work with us to bring his faithful into his kingdom. He called us. He gave us his spirit. He gave us the faith to be able to do that. I'd like to use the life of Abram, Abram, Abraham, and we'll go through that a little bit, and we'll talk about some of the ordinary things that he did because they were part of his culture, and then we'll go on to talk about what we need to do to come out of that. Let's look at Genesis 26.5. We'll begin there. Just to set the stage because I don't want anyone to think that this is critical of Abram. It's just reciting what he did and so we can understand a little more why he did the thing, some of the things that he did. Genesis 26, 5. I think I'm in, oops, the wrong scripture, wrong chapter. Genesis 26, 5. I will do this because Abraham listened to me and obeyed all my instructions, commands, decrees. Obeyed my voice kept my charge, my commandments, and my statues, and my laws. Now before Abraham, uh, before God separated Abram, and I'm going to have trouble with this, keeping these straight. At this point he was Abram. Before God separated Abram, his father Terah left Ur. And this was in Genesis 11.31. But he only made it to Haran. Let's go to Genesis 11. And we'll begin, we'll pick it up in, in verse 26. When Ter Terah was 70 years old, he became the father of Abram, Nahor, and Haran. This is the account of Terah's father, or Terah's family. Terah was the father of Abram, Nahor, and Haran, and Haran was the father of Lot. But Haran died in Ur of the Chaldees, the land of his birth, while his father Terah was still living. Meanwhile, Abram and Nahor both married. The name of Abram's wife was Sarai, and the name of Nahor's wife was Milcah. Milcah and her sister Ishka were daughters of Nahor's brother Haran. But Sarai was unable to become pregnant and had no children. And that's, the fig that's where we're going to start the story. One day, Terah took his son Ab Abram, his daughter-in-law Sarai, Sarai, his son Abram's wife, and his grandson Lot, his son Haran's child, and moved away from Ur of the Chaldees. 
he was headed for the land of Canaan, but they stopped at Haran and settled there. Terah lived for 205 years and died while still in Haran. So from the time he was 70, a little after that, until the time he died, he, they stayed in Haran. 75 years later, God told Abram to get out of his country. And that goes to Genesis 12, verse 1. The Lord had said to Abram, leave your native country, your relatives and your father's family, and go to the land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make you famous, and you will be a blessing to others. I will bless those who bless you and curse those who treat you with contempt. All the families of the earth will be blessed through you. So Abram departed as the Lord had instructed, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he left Haran. Now he was 75 years old and he was still living with his father because that was the patriarchal system. The heir to the patriarch lived with his family and they all stayed together until he inherited. And that meant his father died or his uncle or whatever the case may be. And then he took over the responsibilities for the family and the whole group of people that lived together. He would not inherit for another 60 years in this case because Tara died in, at 205 years old. So there was some time before he would actually inherit. But he obeyed God and left his father and his inheritance except whatever Tara gave him at their separation. Now the parable of the prodigal son addresses this a little bit because even if he was an heir, if he left the, the, his father, he wouldn't receive his inheritance. He, he see, received a, a certain portion of it, whatever his father gave him. Now, as I noted, Ab Abram was not native to Canaan. These were the patriarchal practices of almost the whole area, um, but specifically for Mesopotamia for Abram. Now, like him, we are also creatures of our culture. And that comes into play in a little bit. For quite a long time, biblical scholars looked at these stories, these patriarchal narratives, as fairy tales, made up things that had been injected into the biblical narrative at some point to make a point. Even the, the patriarchs themselves were viewed as folklore. But archaeological evidence now supports the patriarchal narrative and enough writings or stone carvings or whatever they found, tablets, have been found that support the very things that are said in the Bible from a non-scriptural source so that scholars themselves accept them. Let's continue with the narrative. We'll skip over many of the lessons that Abram was learning about deceit and conflict resolution and pick up the story just as Lot and Abram separated their households. So let's turn over to G Genesis 13 and start in verse 14. After Lot had gone, the Eternal said to Abram, Look as far as you can see in every direction, north and south, east and west. I am giving you all this land as far as you can see to you and your descendants as a permanent possession. And I will give you so many descendants that like the dust of the earth, they cannot be counted. Go and walk through the land in every direction, for I am giving it to you. But wait, how is this going to happen? We just read that Sarai was barren. She couldn't have children. Abram raised that question, not at this incident, but later in chapter 15. If we go to chapter 15 and verse 1. Sometime later, it doesn't give an act, exact time, the Eternal again spoke to Abram in a vision and said to him, Do not be afraid, Abram, for I will protect you 
and your reward will be great. But he replied, O sovereign Lord, what good are all your blessings when I don't even have a son? Since you've given me no children, Eliezer of Damascus, a servant in my household, will inherit all my wealth. And that was a standard practice among the patriarchs of this age, that if they had no blood children, that the next closest relationship was a servant born in their house. That they even passed uncles and cousins, anything else, but a servant born in the house was considered to be the next closest living relative. So Eliezer was born in his house and he was set to inherit. You have given me no descendants of my own, so one of my servants will be the heir. Then the Lord said to him, No, your servant will not be your heir, for you will have a son of your own who will be your heir. Then the Eternal took Abram outside and said to him, Look up into the sky and count the stars if you can. That's how many descendants you will have. And Abram believed God and God counted it to him as righteousness, him as righteous because of his faith. Let's drop down to verse 18. So the Eternal made a covenant with Abram that day and said, I have given this land to your descendants all the way from the border of Egypt to the great Euphrates River. And that concluded the cutting of the covenant with Abraham or Brahm now. So let's go to 16 and verse 1. Now Sarai, Abram's wife, had not been able to bear children for him, but she had an Egyptian servant named Hagar. So Sarai said to Abraham, Abram, the Lord has prevented me from having children. Go and sleep with my servant, because I can have children through her. And the actual text there is, she can bear children on my knees, which made that child an heir, made it her child legally. So Hagar was, would be a surrogate mother. Abram agreed to Sarai's proposal. So Sarai, Abram, Abram's wife, took Hagar the Egyptian servant and gave her to Abram as wife. This happened 10 years after Abram had settled in the land of Canaan. So Abram had sexual relations with Hagar and she became pregnant. But when Hagar knew she was pregnant, she began to treat her mistress, Sarai, with contempt. And what is the focus of this practice? Among the patriarchs, the wife was responsible to provide an heir for the family. If she was unable to bear children, it was her responsibility to, to provide a surrogate who could bear an heir. And through the process of birthing on the knees of the wife, that child became a legal heir to the family fortune or lack thereof. In this case, he had a lot. But the single focus was on a family line. It was not a salacious practice, but it was a standard practice, an ordinary thing in their society. The status of the servant or surrogate bearing the child would also be raised because they became the mother of the heir. And you see that here in this scripture because she became arrogant and began treating Sarai with contempt. I'd just do a slight digression here. Abram's heir, Eliezer of Damascus, must have been a very righteous man. He was a loyal and dedicated servant and trusted because later, even after he had been replaced as the heir twice, 
he was sent to obtain a wife for, Jake, for Isaac. So any legal heir, natural born, would replace Eliezer. The child born to a surrogate was a legal heir. Now, Abram did not take this to God. Had he taken it to God and asked God about it, he probably would have done it correctly. But this was ordinary. This was the thing to do. This is the way to, legal way to obtain an heir. The son would be his dis physical descendant, and why take it to God if it was the ordinary thing to do? But as we know, and as has been recorded for our instruction, it was not the way God intended. And, but Abram did not see that yet. Genesis 16 and verse 15. So Hagar gave Abram a son, and Abram named him Ishmael. Abram was 86 years old when Ishmael was born. Chapter 17. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him and said, I am El Shaddai, God Almighty. Serve me faithfully and live a blameless life. I will make a covenant with you by which I will guarantee to give you countless descendants. At this time, Ab Abram fell face down on the ground. Then God said to him, This is my covenant. I will make you the father of a multitude of nations. Which, what's more, I am changing your name. It will no longer be Abram. Instead, you will be called Abraham, for you will be the father of many nations. I will make you extremely fruitful. Your descendants will become many nations, and kings will be among them. I will confirm my covenant with you and your descendants after you from generation to generation. This is an everlasting covenant. I will always be your God and the God of your descendants after you. And I will give the entire land of Canaan where you now live as a foreigner to you and your descendants and it will be their possession forever and I will be their God. Then God said to Abraham, your responsibility is to obey the terms of the covenant. You and all your descendants have this continual responsibility. This is the covenant that you and your descendants must keep. Each male among you must be circumcised. You must cut off the flesh of the foreskin as a covenant between me and you. From generation to generation, every male was, must be circumcised on the eighth day after this birth. This applies not only to members of your family, but to servants born in your household and foreign-born servants whom you have purchased. All must be circumcised. Your bodies must bear the mark of my everlasting covenant. Now this goes along with the patriarchal practice that everybody in the household servants from the lowliest to the greatest all practiced the religion of the patriarch it didn't matter if they came from another culture or not they were uh, obligated to practice the religion of the patriarch and God enforced that he also said it then God said to Abraham, Regarding Sarai, your wife, her name will no longer be Sarai. From now on, her name will be Sarah, and I will bless her and give you a son from her. Yes, I will bless her richly, and she will become the mother of many nations. Kings of nations shall, will be among her descendants. Then Abraham bowed down to the ground, but he laughed to himself in disbelief. How could I be the father of at become a father at the age of 100, he thought. How can Sarah have a baby when she is 90 years old? So Abraham said to God, May Ishmael live under your special blessing. God replied, No, Sarah, your wife, will give birth to a son for you. You will name him Isaac, and I will confirm my covenant with him and his descendants as an everlasting covenant. Up until this point, Abraham didn't realize that he hadn't done things the way God wanted him done. But God patiently worked with him. He was still God's servant. And 
counted righteous because he believed God. But in this matter, he wasn't in line with what God wanted. As for Ishmael, I will bless him also, just as you have asked. I will make him extremely fruitful and multiply his descendants. He will become the father of 12 princes, and I will make him a great nation. But my covenant will be confirmed with Isaac, who will be born to you and Sarah about this time next year. When God finished speaking, he left Abram. On that very day, Abraham took his son, Ishmael, and every male in his household, including those born there and those he had brought, and he circumcised them, cutting off their foreskins, just as God had told him. Abraham was 99 years old when he was circumcised, and Ishmael, his son, was 13. Both Abraham and his son Ishmael were circumcised on the same day, along with all the other men and boys of the household, whether they were born there or bought as servants. All were circumcised with them. Thirteen more years had passed before God told, showed him that he had taken the wrong path to be resolved the next year by the birth of Isaac. In Genesis 18, it continues. And the Lord appeared to Abram, Abraham near the oak grove belonging to Mamre. And it goes through how he greeted them and made a meal for them. And as they ate, Abraham waited on them in the shade of the trees. Verse 9, Where is Sarah, your wife? The visitors asked. She's inside the tent, Abraham replied. Then one of them said, I will return to you about this time next year, and your wife Sarah will have a son. Sarah was listening to this conversation from the tent. Abraham and Sarah were both very old by this time, and Sarah was long past the age of having children. So she laughed silently to herself and said, How could a worn-out woman like me enjoy such pleasure, especially when my master, my husband, is so old? Then the Lord said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh? Why did she say, Can an old woman like me have a baby? Is anything too hard for the Lord? I will return about this time next year, and Sarah will have a son. Sarah was afraid, so she denied it, as we probably would have. And she said, I didn't laugh. But the Lord said, no, but you did laugh. And the men got up from their meal and looked out toward Sodom. And as they left, Abraham went with them to send them on their way. I will skip over the destruction of Sodom and Lot's rescue. And let's go to chapter 21 to continue. Genesis 21, verse 1. The Lord kept his word and did for Sarah exactly what he had promised. She became pregnant and gave birth to a son for Abraham in his old age. This happened at just the time God said it would. And Abraham named their son Isaac. Eight days after Isaac was born, he, he was circumcised as God had commanded. Abraham was 100 years old when Isaac was born. Sarah declared, God has brought me laughter. All who hear this will laugh with me. Who would have said to Abraham that Sarah would nurse a baby? Yet I have given Abraham a son in his old age. When God promises something, it happens. Abraham believed but he didn't understand the process that God would use to give him a son. It would appear that this patriarchal practice of providing an heir was diluted and distorted a little bit by the time of Jacob because although Rachel was barren when she offered her husband her handmaid, Leah had had children and so it would seem to stretch the definition of providing an heir. We won't go into that We'll drop it at that point. 
Now this all happened thousands of years ago, so what bearing can it have on our lives? Well, there are a lot of lessons that can be extracted from this story, but the one I want to stress today is what is ordinary to you may not be the correct path. Like Abram, later Abraham, we are enjoined to wait on the Lord. Let's go to Psalm 27, verse 14. Psalm 27, two times we're enjoined to wait. Verse 13, yet I am confident I will see the Lord's goodness while I am here in the land of the living. Wait patiently for the Lord. Be brave and courageous. Yes, wait, wait patiently for the Lord. In Psalm 37, there's another admonition to wait. 37 and verse 5, commit everything that you do to the Lord. Trust him and he will help you. He will make your innocence radiate like the dawn and justice of your cause will shine like the noonday sun. Be still in the presence of the Lord and wait patiently for him to act. Don't worry about evil people who prosper or fret about their wicked schemes. And again in Psalm 62, Psalm 62 and verse 1. For the choir director, a psalm of David. I wait quietly before the Lord. Wait quietly before the Lord. For my victory comes from Him. Verse 5 in that same chapter. Let all that I am wait quietly before the Lord. For my hope is in Him. And one more in Psalm 130. Psalm 130 and verse 5. I am counting on the Lord. Yes, I am counting on Him. I have put my hope in His word. I long for for the Lord more than centuries long for the dawn yes more than centuries long for the dawn so we see we should wait on God but what should be our ordinary things let's turn over to Philippians 1 Philippians 1, and read verse 9 and 10 from the New King James. And this I pray, that your love may abound still more and more, or revised in English Bible is grow ever richer in knowledge and all discernment, that you may approve the things that are excellent. NIV says, so that you may, ab may be able to discern what is best and that you may be sincere and without offense. NAV says, pure and blameless until the day of Christ. That should be our goal and our aim, to make that ordinary in our lives. Now we know that God's purpose for choosing certain ones at this time is for them to be part of the group that will be the first to enter the family of God at Christ's return. All in that group, hopefully all of us in this room and list those listening as well, must remain in a repentant state of mind, diligently seeking guidance through the study of God's word and drawing on the power of God's spirit to overcome every thought that is not in conformity with the mind of God. Unfortunately, it is ordinary for us to compare ourselves with others. So let's take a look at that a little bit. Let's start in Job 25. 
Job 25. And this is from the New English Translation. Just to get some perspective on this. How much less a mortal man who is but a magnet, maggot and son of man who is only a worm. There are other references where the, referen the earth is referenced as the dust of the balances according to God. So if we're on the dust of the balances we're pretty small worms. Psalm 22.6. Psalm 22.6. I am, but I am a worm, not a man. People insult me and despise me. So if we are no more than worms, are you a more humble worm? How about if you have a worm doctorate? Does that make you a superior worm? What if you've been in the church longer? Does that also make you a superior worm? If you are looking down from your superior worm height on someone because of their choices freely made, you are no better than the tyrants running this asylum we call the United States of America, who are dictating and forcing their fallacious ideas on everyone but themselves under the color of law. You have the same mi mindset and the same attitude if you're looking down on someone else. Let's look at just one verse from Paul's sarcastic comments to the Corinthians. 2 Corinthians 10. Second Corinthians 10 and verse 12. Oh, don't worry. We wouldn't dare say that we are as wonderful as, as these other men who tell you how important they are. But they are only comparing themselves to, other, to each other, using themselves as a standard of measurement. How ignorant. When worms compare themselves among themselves, it doesn't make much difference. Philippians 2. Let's go over to there. Philippians 2. Verse 3, start in that one. Philippians 2, verse 3. Leave no room for selfish ambition and vanity, but humbly reckon to others better than yourselves. Look to each other's interests and not merely to your own. Now, that doesn't mean you become a busybody and you're messing in everybody's business. But it's by care and compassion that you're supposed to be, have interest in others' interests. Take to heart among yourselves what you find in Christ Jesus. He was in the form of God, yet laid no claim to equality with God, but made himself nothing, the form, assuming the form of a slave, bearing the human likeness. He came and lived among us worms. He humbled himself more by becoming obedient even to death, Death on the stake as a criminal. Therefore God raised him to the heights and bestowed on him a name above all names. And I'm going to quote from the exploring the Bible here. This is the mind of Jesus Christ. He was willing to give up all that he had, including his eternal life, because he, was, he esteemed mind, mankind better or more important than himself. He was and is God. That is the kind of mind we are to have, that same willingness to give of ourselves. Is that an ordinary thing to you? I hope it is. And knowing some of you, I know that it is. But it has to be ordinary for the rest of our lives. So if you see someone making poor choices, or what you consider poor choices, should you not be praying for them? Perhaps asking God to guide them in a better direction? Perhaps asking God to forgive their bad decisions and help them learn from their mistakes? Perhaps asking God to help you to have a more compassion toward the weaker brother or sister? Philippians 3, 
just a chapter over. Philippians 3, verse 16. Brothers, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it or attained, as you should also not. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. All of us who are mature should take such a view of things. And if on some point you think differently, that too God will make clear to you. Only let us live up to what we have already attained. The Revised English Bible gives verse 16 as, Only let our conduct be consistent with what we have already attained. Now we saw the single-minded focus on producing an heir during the time of the patriarchs. Would that attitude be appropriate for our time? Not toward producing an heir, but toward becoming an heir. What about a single-minded focus on entering God's kingdom? Are we eager to enter God's kingdom? Are we crowding to get in, as referenced in Matthew eleven twelve? We need to focus on being holy. Holy no, holy things are corrupted by touching impure things. Let's look at Haggai two. Or Haggai two. Verse eleven. Thus says the Lord of hosts, Now ask the priest concerning the law, saying, If one carries holy meat in the fold of his garment, and with the edge he touches bread, stew, wine, or oil, or any food, will it become holy? Then the priest answered and said, No. So that holy food does not transfer holiness to anything. And Haggai said, If one who is unclean because of a dead body touches any of these, Will it be unclean? The priest said, yes, it will be unclean. By contrast, what God touches becomes holy because he is inherently holy. We have been touched by God. We've been called by God. What does that imply for our behavior? Let's look at the admonition to the Colossians in Colossians 3. Colossians 3 and verse 1. Since you have been raised to a new life with Christ, set your sights on the realities of heaven where Christ sits in the place of honor at God's right hand. Our behavior has to come up. We're living by a new standard. The complete Jewish Bible says, verse 2, Focus your minds on the things above, not on the things here on earth. And 3, For you died to this life, and your life is hidden in Christ with God. And when Christ, who is your life, is revealed to the whole world, you will share in all his glory. So put to death the sinful earth, earthly things lurking within you. Have nothing to do with sexual Im immorality, impurity, lust, and evil desires. Don't be greedy, for a greedy person is an idolater, worshiping the things of the world. Now I go over to Ephesians, Ephesians 5. Ephesians 5 and verse 7. Don't participate in the things these people do. For once you were full of darkness, 
but now you have light from the Lord. So live as people of light. For this light within you produces only what is good and right and true. Carefully determine what pleases the Lord. Take no part in the worthless deeds of evil and darkness. Instead, expose them. As a warning given in Luke 11. Luke 11 and verse 34. Your eye is a lamp that provides light for your body. When your eye is good, your whole body is filled with light. But when it is bad, your body is filled with darkness. Make sure that the light you think you have is not actually darkness. If you are filled with light, with no dark corners, then your whole life will be radiant, as though a floodlight were filling you with light. And one final point in Ephesians 5.15. Ephesians 5.15, live life then with a due sense of responsibility, not as men who do not know the meaning and purpose of life, but as those who do. We understand there is more, more to this life than just living and dying and being put in a grave. Make the best use of your time despite all the difficulties of these days. A couple of years ago, I wouldn't have thought that last sentence makes any, diff any sense. But now it makes a lot more sense, despite all the difficulties of these days. Verse 17, don't act thoughtlessly, but understand what the Lord wants you to do. So how do we understand? How can we extract more understanding. We're about to enter a season in this country and most of the world of great idolatry and debauchery. We know it comes every year, just after the feast. So let's start there. Isaiah 1, verse 12. Isaiah 1 and verse 12. Israel had fallen into that pattern. When you come to worship me, who ask you to parade through my courts with your, all your ceremony? Stop bringing me your meaningless gifts. The incense of your offering disgusts me. As for your celebrations of the new moon and Sabbath and your special days for fasting, they are all sinful and false. I want no more of your pious meetings. I hate your new moon celebrations and your annual festivals. They are a burden to me. I cannot stand them. When you lift up your hands in prayer, I will not look. Though you offer many prayers, I will not listen, for your hands are covered with the blood of innocent victims. Wash yourselves and be clean. Get your sins out of my sight. Give up your evil ways. Learn to do good. Seek justice. Help the oppressed. Defend the cause of orphans. Fight for the rights of widows. Come now, let's settle this, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, I will make them white as wool. Though they are red like crimson, I will make them as white as wool. If you will only obey me, you will have plenty to eat. Worshiping God requires more than mindless ritual. And again, I'm quoting from exploring the Bible because I couldn't phrase it any better. People can assemble on the correct days of worship, but unless they are approaching God in true humility, seeking his guidance and correction, all their actions are a waste of time. 
James admonishes us to practice God's word. Let's go over to James 1. James 1 and verse 22. But be doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. From the admonitions we have received over the course of this feast so far, I like the way it is phrased in the New English translation. James 1.22 from New English. But be sure you live out the message and do not merely listen to it and so deceive yourselves. For if some merely listen, someone merely listens to the message and does not live it out, he is like someone who gazes at his own face in a mirror. You see yourself, you walk away, and forget what you look like. Now hopefully we are exposed to the spiritual mirror all the time. Through daily reading and studying, every single Sabbath, we hopefully are able to get together with God's people. If you don't, you hear the messages. We hear bits and pieces. Sometimes we hear large chunks of information that show us the image of what we really are. That needs attention. Occasionally the things that we hear might sting because we know they are true and we understand that. But what's really amazing is how easy it is to just put it all out of our mind as soon as services are over. We just close the book. And yeah, we felt a little twinge or a sting as we heard something. And maybe even in a personal conversation at services, someone said something that struck a chord. But as soon as we're parted company, it's gone. When reading, we might wince when we hear, read the truth. But as soon as the book is closed, it's gone. We either forget it deliberately, in some cases, force it out, or justify ourselves in our own mind depending on where your attitude is at the moment. As we heard yesterday from 1 Thessalonians 5.19, do not quench or extinguish from other translations or stifle or damp the fire of the Spirit. If you're forcing it out of your mind, you're in danger of that. But, as James points out, self-deception is the result of hearing only. If we've deceived ourselves in our own mind, that means we're not discerning our spiritual condition. Let's go over to 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians 11. Verse 30, that is why many of you are weak and sick, and some have even died. But if we would examine ourselves, we would not be judged by God in this way. Yet when we are judged by God, we are being disciplined so that we will not be condemned along with the world. So even in that, that condition, God is still maybe working with you. That's what Paul was talking to us about, discerning our spiritual condition. If we're not discerning, then we're incapable of judging ourselves. That's not a good thing because it will lead us to being incapable of separating truth from error concerning ourselves. It has nothing to do with judging someone else. It has everything to do with judging ourselves. How then can we begin to properly examine ourselves? Jeremiah recorded a way that is, that is not in man to direct his own steps. We don't naturally want to walk down that path. God also told Jeremiah, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Sometimes we're willing to hear. 
but do we then think about it long enough to s actually act on it or live it out? Make it a correction ordinary in our lives. What's, that's the struggle that each of us in this room or on the broadcast has to do, has to take care of, has to deal with it. When you hear something, do something. We have to deal with it in our daily lives. Some might say all of this is very gloomy and depressing, but in reality, it's only depressing when we allow deception to creep into our own minds. Positive change can happen, but it won't if we allow deception to occur or deceive ourselves. Let's go to Jeremiah 7. Look, take a look at this. Jeremiah 17, sorry, Jeremiah 17. In verse 10, But I, the Lord, the Lord, search the heart. I test the mind, even to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his doings. And this will come up a little bit later. How can I know, or how can you know, that we've allowed deception? We just read it. By going to the one who searches and tests our minds and hearts. God does it. He searches and tests us all the time. Any good parent would do the same with their children. They'd be wanting to know, why are they thinking the thoughts they are thinking? What's driving them? But God knows my mind. He knows your mind intimately far better than you or I know our own minds. Many of us know, how many of us know how many hairs do we have on our head? And yet, that's a detail God specifically mentions. Or how many of us keep track of the sparrows that fall? He knows every thought that we think. And he knows why we think it. He knows what it is we're going to do and why we do it. So the good news is that we want to be able to discern our own mind. And do we have access, and do have access, to the source if we really want to find it? The real question is, how badly do we want to know? Do we really want to go there badly enough to actually do something about it? As we saw, some of those in Cor Corinth had lost their spiritual focus. We don't want to do that. We want to keep in touch with God. Ask Him to give us dis the discernment to discern our faults and our weaknesses. In Matthew 6, God gives us the tools that help us stay close to Him. Some of the tools. Or if we're not close to him, to draw closer to him, to become more con discerning. In Matthew 6, 5, Matthew 6, in verse 5, When you pray, you shall not be like the hip hypocrites, for they love to pray, standing in the synagogues and on the corners of the streets, that they may be seen by men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. But you, when you pray, go into your room, and when you have shut your door, pray to your Father who is in the secret place, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. Further in Matthew 6, verse 7 and 8, When you pray, again, do not use vain repetitions as the heathens do for they think that they will be heard because of their many words. Therefore, do not be like them, for your Father knows the things that you have need of before you ask Him.
Now, we've heard this before over and over again. But here, Christ is delivering some very foundational truths to the disciples before they began their ministry. They're very important in order to stay close to God. Prayer is one of these things. It's foundational. But he's showing that he isn't interested in hypocritical prayer, but the kind we need to pray is what pleases God. Let's look over the, the prayer. Let's just go on down the, the chapter to verse 9 and begin there. In this manner, therefore, pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. This model includes the basic elements that we need to keep in the forefront of our mind. I'm just going to mention four of them. Hallow God's name. Pray for his kingdom and his, his will in our lives. Ask for his bread. Now that can mean food, but more importantly, the bread of life, God's word. Ask for forgiveness according to how we forgive. That should remind us we better be forgiving as we heard previously. Of course, that's very something we're very familiar with. It's easy to gloss over each of these points. But equally fundamental is Christ's very next thought after the prayer. In verse 16, Moreover, when you fast, do not be like the hypocrites with a sad countenance. For they disfigure their faces that they may appear to men to be fasting. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. But you, when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face, so you do not appear to men to be fasting, but to your Father who is in the secret place, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. We see here that Christ said both when you pray and when you fast. In other words, that's a given. You will be fasting. You will be praying. He didn't emphasize one over the other. They're both tools to use to draw closer to God. One is done daily or multiple times during the day. We're told to pray continuously. Fasting is done on an occasional basis, but both of these are necessities. They're on the same par. They are that important. Prayer is a part of staying focused, but fasting is a means of humbling ourselves and drawing closer and refocusing when we've lost focus. It will very quickly remind us of our status as worms. When we have nothing to eat or drink, we wilt very quickly. Let's go back over to James chapter 4. James chapter 4. In verse 10, or 7, I'm sorry. So submit to God, but resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and make your hearts pure, you double-minded. Grieve, mourn, and weep. Turn your laughter into mourning, your joy into despair. Humble yourself before the Lord, and he will exalt you. 35th Psalm. David wrote that he humbled himself with fasting. So this is all about refocusing 
through fasting coupled with prayer. We just read, submit to God and resist the devil because sometimes we don't. Sometimes we forget it was what it was we once saw in the spiritual mirror. If we don't hear or do in a timely fashion, we easily become accustomed to doing the wrong thing. It becomes our ordinary thing instead of what we should be doing. The devil will deceive us into thinking we're okay because we're, we slowly let it become the ordinary thing in our own personal life. We've become, become unable to actually discern our own minds and our own selves. So, what is our focus? We need to be focused like a laser on be being holy, becoming holy. Always remembering that holy things are corrupted by touching impure things. Remember, we have been touched by God. He has set us apart. He has made us holy. So what else can we do? Quite often we're reminded of the big three, prayer, Bible study, and fasting. They're a foundation. And our adversary wants us to fail in every one of them. But there's one that is spectacularly easy to let go. And it's a fourth, fourth step. Now our busy schedules we think we need constant stimulation. We've got our phones in front of us all the time. We've got our TVs going. We're watching streaming videos on our computer or our tablet or our phone. We've got Steam, Hulu, YouTube, Instagram, TikTok, Twitter, Disney, Pluto. Need I go on? We've got a great smorgasbord of entertainment and distraction. So what does that take the place of? When's the last time you sat and did nothing? Didn't play with your phone, didn't watch streaming videos, anything, meditate. David is a good example. I muse on all your works. All your hands have wrought. We sing that as a hymn. Psalm 143 and verse 5. I remember the days of old. I meditate on all your works. I muse on the works of your hands. Go out and s at night and sit and look at the stars. Or find a peaceful place and look at a brook or a meadow. And the Holy Spirit has a subtle influence. And if you're busy, you might not notice it. Notice how the Apostle Paul states it in 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians 3.3 3. Second Corinthians 3.3 3 from the New Living. Clearly you are a letter from Christ showing the result of our ministry among you. This letter is written not with a pen and ink but with the spirit of the living God. It is not carved on tablets of stone because hopefully we don't have stone hearts anymore. We have hearts of flesh. But on human hearts. Are you responsive to that influence? Or, conversely, do you need a strong bridle or a regular clubbing? How does it influence? Does it grab you by the shirt front and yell? No. Might only be a feeling. That doesn't seem right. It might come to you in a dream. 
or you suddenly realizing and remembering something you read at another time. Musing or meditating gives us time to process, time to piece together our understanding, to integrate, if you will, the new, any new information into that framework of understanding. Or conversely, to alter our framework of understanding to fit the new reality. So remember, focus on being holy. Remember that holy things are corrupted by touching um, impure things. And remember, we have been touched by God and made holy. Let's go to 2 Corinthians. Just a couple, one more chapter over. 2 Corinthians 4. This is Paul talking about his ministry, but it's applicable to us as well. Therefore, verse 1, since we have this ministry as we have have received mercy, we do not lose heart. Here Paul draws attention to the fact that he did not seek the position he held in the church. It was God's decision to show him mercy. Likewise, we did not choose God. He chose us and in his mercy led us to Jesus and life. Second Timothy 2.15 Be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing, the New American Standard says, handling accurately the word of truth. All of those with whom God's Spirit is working are able, with the help of God's Holy Spirit, to comprehend, understand, rightly parse, and use the Word of God accurately. The power to open the mind of a man so that he can comprehend the truth rests solely with God and is accomplished through God's Spirit. Without the working of that Spirit, no amount of eloquent speech, human reasoning, or argument of logic can impart spiritual comprehension. As we have all probably faced at one time or another, you can't convert our relatives or our friends. They can see a certain amount, but unless God opens their mind, they just cannot understand. Second Corinthians 4.4 4. Satan, who is the God of this world, has blinded the minds of those who don't believe. They are unable to see the glorious light of the good news. They don't understand this message about the glory of Christ, who is the exact likeness of God. Verse 7. Now, we now have this light shining in our hearts, but we ourselves are like fragile clay jars containing this great treasure. This makes it clear that our great power is from God, not from ourselves. Verse 16. That is why we never give up. Though our bodies are dying, our spirits are being renewed every day. For our present troubles are small and won't last very long, yet they produce for us a glory that vastly outweighs them and will last forever. So don't look at the troubles we can now see. Rather, we fix our gaze on things that cannot be seen. For the things we see now will soon be gone, but the things we cannot see will last forever. Let's go to Galatians 3. Galatians 3 and verse 6. Remember this from way back in the beginning. In the same way, Abraham believed God, and God counted him as righteous because of his faith. The real children of Abraham, then, are those who put their faith in God. Verse 29. And now that you belong to Christ, 
You are the true children of Abraham. You are his heirs. And God's promise to Abraham belongs to you. Now, more than ever, at any time in my past 57 feasts, has there been a more important time to focus? Not on some new game or movie or amusing toy, but on God's way. In the final analysis, we need to increase ever more our focus on God's way. Remain dedicated and determined to obey God, no matter if it costs us our life in the short term. Because we have been touched by God. We have been made holy. A couple pages over, Galatians 5.25. Since we are living by the Spirit, let us follow the Spirit's leading in every part of our lives. And then we will reach Revelation 21.3. Revelation 21, 3. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, the residence of God is among human beings. He will live among them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them. Our ordinary things will then always be holiness and righteousness, serving and praising God for all eternity. Let's conclude in Revelation 21. Revelation 21 and verse 22. Now I saw no temple in the city because the Lord God, the all-powerful, and the Lamb are its temple. The city does not need the sun or the moon to shine on it because the glory of God lights it up. And its lamp is the Lamb. The nations will walk by its light, and the kings of the earth will bring their grandeur into it. Its gates will never be closed during the day, and there will be no night there. They will bring the, grand, bring the grandeur and the wealth of nations into it, but nothing ritually unclean will ever enter into it. No one will ever be touched by the unholy. Nor any one who does what is detestable or practices falsehood, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. 